Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the shadows and you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and also that notification bell. Set that one to all so you will be reminded of every time I upload a video which tends to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, that information can be found down below in the description box. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. From once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Middle of Nowhere Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. My mom was 30 when this happened. She had a habit of jogging late at night in the only forest in our hometown, which is also a huge tourist attraction out in the middle of nowhere. The forest has a long track and is illuminated by streetlights, so you can see everything in front and behind. But sides are completely black when it's dark. It was summer, and she was jogging one night as usual. This time, she got extremely scared for no apparent reason. She continued jogging for a few more minutes, but turned around and saw a pair of jeans in the middle of the track. She immediately went home. A few days later, a 31-year-old Mexican woman's body was found in that same forest. It was all over the news and all over Balkan countries. It was summer of 2012, and our small, safe country in my hometown will never, ever forget this. Stuff like this almost never happens here. My mom literally never went jogging after this. It could have been her. Locals don't go to that forest late at night anymore. And to think the killer should be out in 2027 is just fucking insane. I used to work closing shifts at a certain unnamed fast food franchise. Because of this, my coworkers and I would generally clock out together around midnight. I consider myself friends with all of my close co-workers. So, during the summertime, we get into the habit of staying after work in the parking lot to shoot the shit and, you know, hang around. The restaurant is in a generally nice neighborhood. Regular patrolling cops, and we were right next to our car, so I never felt unsafe. One night, we were talking to each other for two hours or so, so I got into my car to leave at around 2 in the morning. This was probably really stupid of me, but my heart clenched as I realized that my gas light was on and had been while I had driven to work earlier that day. I reasoned with myself that I likely wouldn't have enough gas to get home and then drive out again the next morning to get some. So, against my better judgment and my nerves, I resigned myself to driving to the Circle K two streets over. This was still a nice neighborhood, and my only other option for gas was a station that doubled as a truck stop and a Greyhound bus stop too. So that one scared me more. Looking back, I probably should have just asked my coworker to come with me, and then this wouldn't have happened. As I pulled up to the pump closest to the door, I realized that the other only car at the pumps belonged to a middle-aged man in probably his 30s or 40s, I would guess. He made me nervous, but didn't come near me or try to talk to me, so I wasn't exactly scared. The gas attendant was a woman, so that made me feel a little less nervous. I asked where the bathrooms were, and when I got out of them, the other man was gone. I thanked the attendant on my way out of the station. As I was walking towards my car, I heard a man call out to me. Hey, miss. I look over, and there's a man coming out of the garbage corral. Can you come over here, please? 
I noticed that he wasn't in uniform. Not that it would have made the situation better, so I could tell he did not work there. At this point, I was next to my car at the well-lit gas pump. Um, no, I called out, and even I heard how anxious I sounded. He started walking over to my car. At this point, I'll be satisfied with just filling my tank halfway. I feel for my back pocket where I usually keep my phone, and it isn't there. Panicked, I figure I forgot it inside my car, but don't want to look in case the guy is paying attention to that. Nice night out, right? He asks. He steps into the pump area, and he's still a few yards away. I mutter out a nervous, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and hope he leaves me alone. He doesn't, and asks, how old are you? Now, I'd been scared for my entire interaction, but brand new warning signs and alarms were going off in my head as I blurted out, I'm only 16. I'm not, I was actually 19 when this happened, and I'm 20 now, but... He didn't need to know that, and I figured if he thought I was a minor, he'd leave me alone. He looks at me with narrowed eyes and starts to say, Oh, well, you look... He cuts off, but I knew he was going to say I looked older than that, of course. I'm satisfied with the amount of gas in my car, so I start getting the pump gun back in its place and leaving. So, how's your night, miss? He asks, and I tell him it's been fine and ask him how his has been. My tone is still very nervous, and I'm only answering because I'm getting into my car and I've been conditioned to be polite above all else. He's scarily close to my car, maybe five feet away. He looks at me again and then walks away. I lock my car immediately and started to get it ready to go. He wasn't anywhere in the parking lot when I look up, so I figured he's left. Either way, I hightail it out of there. As I'm leaving, I pay attention to behind me, and I pass the building. I see him standing flush against the side of the building, watching my car leave. I was still shaken when I parked in my driveway, because although there was no way he could have followed me home, I know that was a situation where I was either going to get trafficked or run next to a dumpster. Quick context. I'm an 18-year-old female working the 4 p.m. to midnight shift at a nice and clean gas station convenience store in Canada. Because of the location of my workplace, it's right beside a highway. It is common for people to settle in the parking lot for a while or even the entire night. What isn't common is when someone parks right outside the window beside the cash register, parallel to the building. It's about 11 p.m. and I'm preparing to close my shift, excited to go home and finally get some rest. Keep in mind, I'm only 18, I still live with my parents. A rush of customers comes and goes when I notice the car parked outside. Right beside the cash register, there is a huge window in order for the workers to look out to see the customers at the pumps. Many people have parked there before, but none have ever parked parallel to the store, snuggled up to the curb. Whatever, I thought. Maybe the man or woman is just exhausted. 11.30 rolls around, and the car is still parked there. I had to go outside to shut the oil shack, which happened to be right next to where the car was parked. As I close the shack, I look into the car to see the driver's seat reclined all the way back with a man laying down, with a smirk on his face. I rushed inside and got behind the counter, right as one of my regulars walked in. I pointed out the man in the car, joking that he's waiting for me. The irregular seemed to worry, telling me to call the cops. He said to stay safe. He had to get back to work. I decided against calling the cops, because the guy could have easily just been there resting after a long haul. 
At around 11.45, I decided to call my sister because the guy was still outside. We live about 15 minutes from my workplace, a perfect amount of time for her to get there in time for closing. I told her the lowdown, but she responded that she was leaving at the moment and would be there soon. 11.48, the guy gets out of the car. Well, shit. I'm closing in less than 10 minutes, and now he decides he wants a snack? As I watch him, I noticed he is walking around near the pumps, staring off into the sky, later to assume that he was looking for the cameras. 11.50, and he walks into the store, not returning my greeting. He walks right towards the bathrooms. A couple of customers walk in, and because I was busy with them, I assume the man may have walked out without me knowing. 12.01, and my sister shows up. Thank God. But the car was still parked outside. She comes in and asks what's up, and I ask if he's in his car. She replies no. That's when my heartbeat increased. I looked at the bathroom doors, where both signs, there's two bathrooms, one for men and one for women. When vacant, the little sign will be green. When occupied and locked, the sign will be red. Or green. When the bathroom lights are on, you can see the glow from underneath the doorway. The lack of the glow made me assume that there was no one in any of them because the lights are motion censored. I told my sister that there was no one in the bathrooms, so I began locking the doors and shutting off the lights. My sister, with her balls of steel, opened the women's bathroom, and who's still sitting on the toilet? She closed the door and begins yelling at him that the store was closing. A couple minutes pass and he's still in there, so she pounds on the door a little bit more. It's about 12.08 now, and the creep comes out of the bathroom, grabs a cookie, buys it, and walks out. He never even looked me in the eye or spoke. He got into his car right away and hurried off. I finished locking up and met my sister at a Tim Hortons nearby. Had my sister not been there, I'm unsure what could have been the outcome. I could easily not be typing this right now. Thankfully, that day at the beginning of my shift, I put in my two weeks notice. After telling my parents and my mom being the Criminal Minds fan, thought that the man may have scanned the property for cameras and went into the bathroom to wait for no one to check them during the closing process of the store. He may have parked parallel for a quick getaway, so I'm glad I'm done working there. Creep waiting in the women's bathroom? I hope we never meet again. My uncle lives in Russia for more than two decades. From time to time, I used to travel there for holidays since early childhood. He lived in a rural area not too far from the city of Moscow. He held a small farm, cows, pigs, chickens, and such. I was 19 when I went to my uncle's for the summer break, since I was old enough to help him around the place and I had a driver's license. Uncle asked me to get into the truck and take the hay back to the farm from the plot of land that he used to grow and get ready hay for winter. He had to keep feeding two cows and without hay it'd be almost impossible to keep cattle in the winter. I'd have to make a few trips to drive all stacks of hay from plot to home but as a motivation uncle promised to let me borrow his car for a night out with my friends. We made a deal, and the first trip came and went without any incidents. It wasn't a big distance between plot and farm. It would be 25 to 27 kilometers, maybe. But loading and unloading truck took a long time, so by the time the second trip came around, it was already well past sunset. I was driving a truck back to the farm, full of another load of hay, when suddenly, on the road, appeared a man. He was smiling and holding up 1,000 rubles in hopes of catching a ride. 
You ever get that feeling when something is out of place, but you can't quite put your finger on it? I had that weird feeling and decided to play it safe and fair. I didn't stop and continued my journey back to the farm with my uncle. I felt a bit guilty for leaving that man there, but in my defense, I was 19 years old and a girl driving a car that wasn't even mine and loaded with tons of hay, which cost quite a bit of money, mind you. I didn't want to risk not only getting hijacked, but also maybe something worse. With such thought, I calmed my conscience and in a few moments forgot the encounter entirely. Not much after, I heard a weird noise coming from the back side of the trunk. Something was hitting against the truck bed door and I got scared that I might have thrown all the hay without knowing it. I stopped the can and got out, looked back, checked the door, latches, and crawled under, but everything seemed fine. I shrugged and returned back to the cabin. I was about to open the door and get inside when I saw that old man sitting in the cabin of the truck, smiling at me and holding out the bill of 1,000 ruble. I didn't even hear how he opened and closed the doors. I almost fell back from sheer shock. How the fuck? When? Uh, why? I had thousands of questions just lining up in my head. How this dude got in here? How he caught up? Why is he sitting in my uncle's fucking truck? I yelled at him to get the fuck out of the truck, but... The old man was just sitting there, smiling, and holding out that damn bill. I yelled at him, threatened, not nothing, and standing there, outside the truck. Holding the doorknob of the driver's side, I realized that I'm scared to death of that man. Luckily for me, I saw the lights of another truck coming up my way. I leaned out all the was, holding myself with the doorknob, and started waving my hand. While the truck was getting closer, I was thinking for myself that I'd get this creepy old fart a ride for his life, and that bill far up his ass. The truck was almost here, and I decided to look into the cabin of my truck and saw him now scooted over to the driver's seat, face stuck to the window and staring at me. I fell off and landed on my ass from fright. Then... I heard the doors of my truck opening from the passenger side and scrambled to my feet. Dude walked over. He was still smiling and holding out that bill. Only then I noticed what he held in another hand. Small kitchen hatchet. This wasn't fun and games anymore. I backed away and just in moments time a truck arrived and stopped right beside me and the man that stopped before me turned and dashed into the forest, away from the road. Driver of the other truck looked over and asked what was wrong. I just yelled, There's a man with a thousand ruble bill and kitchen hatchet here. Dude didn't even get out. He locked his doors and ordered me to do the same. Jumping back into my truck, I locked the doors and waited for a while with the other driver. What we were waiting for, I don't know. Maybe to see him again? Wait and see if he'd turn up again? Ten minutes went by, and the driver of the truck decided it was safe enough now to get out of our cars. We got out, shook hands, and lit cigarettes. I told him what happened from the beginning while I smoked like crazy. The driver... Elila, how I later found out, was just nodding along and looking around, seemingly looking for some movement from the side of the forest. Budding cigarettes, he advised me to never stop the car no matter what, and especially if going out at night. He was long-haul driving and seemingly speaking from experience, so I agreed and bid him a farewell. We got into our own separate trucks and parted ways. When I got to the farm, I informed my aunt about what had happened, and as I expected, she started freaking out. Called my uncle immediately, explained everything, and soon enough, 
neighbor boy that was helping all day unloading truck here in farm tuned keys and drove back to my uncle himself. And to be honest, I was happy that he relieved me of that duty. I was thinking all night about how that guy caught up with me. I wasn't speeding, but wasn't crawling either. My only guess was that he ran after my truck and somehow jumped to the back door. He held up for a while and then started to make noises, so I'd stop to get out and investigate, which is how it exactly happened. Why was he doing all this? I can only guess. I never met that man ever since, and to this day, I have no idea what all of that was about, or what would have happened if not some random driver in the right place at the right time happened to show up. Thankfully, I didn't have a chance to find out. Thank you, Leela, for amazing timing, and as far as the old man with his stupid bill and hatchet, go kick rocks and stay the hell away from me. I was on a solo road trip several years back and had fancied that I could make an 18-hour drive in one go. I was wrong, and I'd started to pass out at the wheel and so decided I needed to nap somewhere. The closest thing for many miles was a little gas station set off a mountain in the middle of nowhere. Just dark landscape as far as you could see and some truckers ahead and behind on the road. There was one car at the station that I had soon belonged to the clerk. I parked where I was still illuminated by the station lights, but away from the main parking spaces, so that no one would reasonably need to pull up next to me. I set an alarm for 45 minutes and figured I'd see how I felt then. I woke suddenly and glanced at my watch first, and about 20 minutes had passed. Then, I glanced out of my driver's side window and found myself making eye contact with a man. A truck had pulled up about a space away from my car. There were no passengers, and the driver was on his passenger side of the truck, with his front and back passenger windows down. He had a long chain in his hands and seemed to have been pulling it from the back of his truck while watching me sleep. A second after we made eye contact, he froze and stood still as he stared right at me. Then he began to quickly pull the chain and take a step towards my window while not breaking eye contact. My keys were still in the ignition, so I made a hasty exit. As I pulled away, I looked into my rearview mirror and the man had moved to the back of his truck and rested his forearms on it as he watched me drive off. I can't prove he was doing anything nefarious, but there wasn't a need for him to park next to me when I parked out of the way. He didn't need to watch me sleep or make intense eye contact. Didn't need to step towards my window. Not sure what was happening with the chain because there was nothing in his truck bed visible or around his truck that would call for a chain. Definitely didn't need to stop what he was doing and watch me drive away. During a university trip to a ski resort, me and some friends went to watch the stars. We were all a part of a astronomy club and wanted to note down some key information we couldn't have seen with the bright city light. It was our first year and the university, and we went to the forest, but still close to the skiing place. We took some pictures and noted some things until our legs got cold, so we decided to go on up. Two of my friends, let's call them Steve and Bob, fell down, grabbing us thanks to instinct, which led us to fall down. Note, we crossed the barrier, so that's why we kept falling, we were rolling, but since our hands and arms were cold and we ourselves are tired, we couldn't move despite our best attempts after a while. 
we dropped off this unused ski trail that were double black diamond. We later learned that the trail was abandoned, but didn't know it at the time. As we stood up, we felt like we were being watched. Time also seemed to go really fast somehow, but that's probably because we were tired and the place was very calm. We walked around the trail, but heard the scream of a man. We thought someone had tripped like us, so we ran to help, yelling for him. No response ever came from the man, other than screaming, moaning, groaning, and crying. We yelled again, but the man never responded. As we closed in the distance, some of us tried to go back, because the man might do something bad to us. But as we walked just a few steps closer, we saw the shadow of a 30-ish year old man, weeping. We were probably around 20 meters away, but that man was the most scariest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Doing nothing but crying on the snow with nothing but a jacket and a pair of sweatpants. As soon as we saw him, he ran as fast as he could, up, holding back the pain. We spent a good 30 minutes reclimbing that cliff. When we finished, we quickly ran back to our rooms. We reported the incident to the police, but never heard anything back. This was legit, the scariest thing that has ever happened in my life and my group of friends. The trail somehow made time go by so fast with its calmness and beautiful glow under the moonlight and the light of the stars. My memory is kind of crappy, but I at least do remember that what felt like five minutes wondering was almost 15 minutes outside. Alaska is the perfect place to go if you want to get away from the rest of the world. As America's least densely populated state, you have plenty of breathing room from any kind of authority or prying eyes that may want to know what you are up to. For this reason, my home state is very attractive to all sorts of weird and unsavory groups. I've stumbled across Scientology centers at the end of a dirt back road with nothing else for miles around. Heard stories from doomsday preppers who claim to have bunkers made out of shipping containers in the sides of the mountain and met people who have come out of religious cults in the interior that wanted to keep their followers away from any contact with the outside world. All of this and more you can find in Alaska. I was born and raised in Anchorage, the only big city in the state. Growing up, we had about 250,000 people in a city. It takes about 30 minutes tops to drive across, so that gives you an idea of what we up north consider a big city. The only other real city in the state is Fairbanks. These two cities are connected by 360 miles of a two-lane highway. It's a seven-hour drive one way to get between them through one of the most beautiful landscapes on the planet. Mountains rise up on either side of you between Anchorage and Denali National Park before you drive through these colossal canyons carved out of the rock over tens of thousands of years by melting glaciers and rivers. Past Denali is another three hours of driving through a vast, flat interior plain with mountains in the distance. I say all of this to help you understand just how desolate it feels here in Alaska, even on the highway. After you get out of Anchorage or Fairbanks, there is nothing but wilderness as far as the eye can see, save for the occasional small down with a maximum population of about a thousand people on a good day. Ten years back, it was even less. Alaskan girls are built tough. We change tires, hunt, fish, camp, and generally have a great appreciation 
for the great outdoors that women in the lower 48 don't really have if they're near a city. The joke is that Anchorage is the biggest rural city in the country. All this brings context to the following story. In high school, things were different, or at least they felt different. I was a young and stupid woman who thought I could conquer anything due to the aforementioned built tough attitude I was raised with. Senior year of high school, I decided to treat myself to a camping trip into the mountains up past Tarakitna. Nothing fancy, just an overnight or two in the most beautiful state at the most beautiful time of the year, mid-June. Going up north in peak summer here has a weird feeling to it. The sun never really sets. If you've never seen the movie Midsummer, that's what it's like. It gets to about dusk and that's it. It's still bright and sunny out the whole night through. Shout out to the readers in the far north of Scandinavia and Greenland. The false sense of security I had thinking that the midnight sun would mean safety probably nearly got me killed, or worse. My second mistake was not telling anyone where I was going. I just packed up for my trip, stopped at Subway for a lunch, and headed out to the great beyond. The drive was fine. A solid two and a half hours of driving north along the highway took up almost the afternoon as I jammed out to the greatest hits from the radio on Cool 97.3. After you get through the Matsu Valley, you get into the mountains again. Tall spruce and evergreen trees line the road on both sides, with the occasional empty space where there had been some clear-cut logging. All of this gives you a sense that while you're out in the wilderness, you are still connected to civilization in some way. This led me to my biggest mistake, not staying at a national park campground. I was in high school with only a part-time job and didn't want to pay the $15 overnight camp fee and was too scared to risk the fine, so I found a spot that looked good and pulled off the road. The map I got from my dad said that there was an old mining site up and nearby the mountain, so I decided that would be the best spot to head to for the night. My logic must have been that it was badass to spend a night in a mining ghost town or something. Pulled off the road, packed up my backpack, put on some bug spray, grabbed my map and compass, and started off into the woods. Now, this hadn't been the first time I had done this. I've been on wilderness backpacking trips on my own, with my father throughout the childhood. I knew my orientation skills and had taken some wilderness survival courses at camp. I wasn't just some dumb blonde wandering off into the woods with no idea of where I was. Or so I thought. A solid 45-minute hike up into the hills, I finally made it to where the old mining camp was supposed to be. There was nothing there. Just an old concrete foundation with some holes in it and nothing else. I was very disappointed, but unsurprised at the outcome. I set up camp off in the woods and set to building a fire for dinner on the concrete slab. Here you're supposed to set up cooking a ways off from the camp, just in case bears are nosy. Last thing you want is a 1,300-pound grizzly poking his nose in your tent, wondering why you smell like Campbell's soup and s'mores. By this time, it was getting late, about 10 p.m., but the sun was still high in the sky, and by the time dinner was over, it was nearly 11. I was starving and dug in. An hour later, it was about as dark as it was going to get, so I hunkered down in my tent for the night, confident that the overgrowth was private enough for whatever animals might come out around then. I woke two voices in the distance and slow moving, crashing through the underbrush. My first thought was hunters. 
My dad and I had run into a few on some campouts, so it wasn't uncommon. I relaxed and figured they would just pass through without incident and closed my eyes again. That's when they found my fire pit. A man's voice cried out into the brightish forest. Who the fuck is camping on our property? I froze. I knew I had fucked up and was getting up, grabbing my purse and putting on my shoes so I could go apologize before I heard the man again. When we find you, you're fucking dead. You're on private militia property and trespassers get shot. That's when the whole situation changed. I didn't know what to do at that point. I couldn't just pick up my tent and shit with some armed guy lurking around. I carefully put my shoes on, put my keys in my purse, and slunk away into the underbrush as quietly as I could. My thought was to slip away, wait until they got bored and left, then go back, pack up, and leave. I spent 20 minutes hunkered behind a log in the woods, barely in earshot, and before I heard a second voice calling for the others. They had found my tent and were tearing it apart, going through the stuff. I heard one shout out, Bed still warm, and trespassers a chick. She left her underwear. The first man shouted out, Okay, fan out and find her. The bitch thinks she can trespass. Then there's gonna be hell to pay. At that point, I wasn't concerned that I had left my spare change of underwear in my bag or not, or that these creeps had found it. I needed to get out of there and fast. Quietly, I made my way down the mountain for a good 30 minutes, tiptoeing and taking care not to step on twigs or make a ruckus. After the rustling and shouting of the men had faded quite a bit, I said fuck it and booked it as fast as I could in the midnight sun down to the hills. I tripped and fell and got scraped up more times than I cared to remember. Finally, I made it back to the road that, much to my horror, there was no car. I knew I had come out up or down the road from where I had been. I couldn't quite remember where I was at the time, but picked a direction and started walking. I rounded a corner on the road and saw my car. and the two men standing beside it. They were armed and dressed in surplus military gear. I hid in the bushes on the side of the road and watched. A while later, several more men appeared from the trail that I had taken. They dumped all of my stuff next to the car, hopped back on their ATVs, and drove off. I went up to my car, careful not to be seen, and found a note on my dashboard. It read something like, If we ever catch you on our property again, we won't hesitate to use force. Consider this a warning. I went back to start loading stuff into my car and noticed what they had done. They'd cut up or destroyed all of my gear, probably as punishment for trespassing. Honestly, I'm thankful they did that because I'm grateful I didn't get shot. Ever since then, I have taken great care to camp only in designated camping areas. To the weird Alaskan militia group, I know you aren't actually going to kill me, but nevertheless, please let's not meet again. My partner was at a bachelorette party at a campground. I was not invited for reasons of being a male, the audacity, I know, but stayed up late in case anything happened. She calls me at 12 a.m., panicked, saying, he was just in here, and I had her recount everything after taking a few breaths. So this is her story, not mine, but I was very much involved. After a fun day and night of drinking, playing games, hiking, swimming, they decided to call it a night. 
We will call my partner Mindy for anonymity. Mindy decided to finally take a shower after everyone else was turning in, and I walked to the camp bathrooms. She noticed an older white male sitting on a bench, but he doesn't pay her any mind listening to something on his phone. She assumed that he was waiting for someone or just sitting on the bench at night. Campgrounds are full of strange bench sitters. It's one of those timed showers where you push the button to get the water to go. So her shower was very short, and she had brought her clothes in so she could get dressed. She heard someone else and assumed another person needed to use the shower. As she opened the curtain and sees the man peeking into the shower stalls, one at a time. She was the only person in there, and all she could do was stand there, mouth agape, staring at the man. He realized someone was standing there, and when he saw her, his eyes got super wide, and he sprinted away. I told her that the ranger or camp staff should be nearby and to let them know immediately, or to call the police. But... Since she was at someone's celebration, she didn't want to disturb anything. I figured there was some shock and didn't want to raise her anxiety by arguing. Still, neither of us slept that night as I waited for her calls and she waited for a man to break into the tent. She tells the ranger the next morning and they say, We've gotten several reports yesterday about that man, but no one can seem to find him flabbergasted that the man had once again caused discomfort. It seems to me that he was trying to muster courage to potentially do something worse, as it was a whole day of stalking, hiding, waiting, and speaking into several shower stalls, but that he was still timid. I'm just glad she came home safely, and I really wished I was there because... I'm the guy who runs towards explosions, literally happened once, and would love to sate my contained bloodlust by beating down a villain. I don't know if this was a windy boy or a skinny boy or just a curious animal or whatever it was but I had a pretty close encounter with something out in the woods, a park in Colorado. My family was out there with some family friends. They had a camper, and we had a big REI tent. It was a biggish site with a couple of large trails that came through it to the road, though it's important to note that there weren't any campers in any of the states within a couple miles of us. We spent the day riding dirt bikes and all headed back to our respective sleeping areas, but I, as usual, had a hard time sleeping. Around 2 a.m., according to my phone, I looked out the slightly see-through mesh of the tent and saw a single branch or something across the trail from me illuminated. I spent a long time trying to figure out what it was and the light never moved. This and the next morning, I know for sure, happened. The next thing being footsteps. Slow, ponderous footsteps that made the gravel crunch, walking around the perimeter of our tent. Repeatedly. I figured it was just an inquisitive animal whose favorite spot we had taken. But it grew unnerving as the steps continued. The branch out my little window was still lit up. I started to drift to sleep slightly, but was woken when I noticed the steps had stopped and the branch was no longer visible. But something worse was happening. Side note, it's possible I was dreaming by this point, but I was quite lucid, able to move, and the camp's layout was exactly the same. My dreams tend to screw with details and environments. So I find it unlikely. Anyways, the thing that was happening was this. 
a few feet outside my mesh window, I could just barely see a crouched, motionless figure. Its outlines reminded me of one of the heretics from Outlast 2, a nude figure with branches around its head. I couldn't tell which way it was facing, and my night vision hasn't ever been the greatest, but I could see it. My memory gets quite shaky here, but at some point, the figure was gone, and I was able to see the branch again. It was starting to resemble a crucifix to me, though I'm sure that was pareidolia. I fell asleep. The next morning, all seemed normal. The first thing I did was look out the tent for footsteps, but all there was was gravel and packed dirt, so no luck. Eventually, though, over breakfast, we discussed what everyone else had apparently seen later in the morning. 2.30 a.m.-ish after I fell asleep. A single person walking down the trail through the camp with a flashlight. It wasn't any of us, and any other person would have had to walk miles to get to us. We decided it was just someone who liked to walk ultimately, but it still makes my skin crawl. Anyways, there it is. Any ideas on what that could have been? A few years back, I went camping with two buddies in the mountains near Lake Tahoe. We hiked about two hours with our packs to a small lake and set up camp. All was normal during the day, made some dogs and beans, and then stayed up till it was dark to watch the stars. Once it was dark out, we climbed up to the top of the large boulder to get a vantage point to see the stars over the trees. I recalled that there was no moon out that night because we could see the stars so clearly due to the limited ambient light. And we are pretty far out, so there is no background noise or light from humans. Once our eyes adjusted, after half an hour or so, we could see all the stars and even some satellites slowly moving in the sky. Note, it is very dark out with no moon will be important later. So, after we were done stargazing, we head down to our tents set up right by the lake. We have two two-person tents for the three of us. My two friends shared one tent and I was asleep in the other one. We set up the tents right next to each other on the same flat spot. I fell asleep pretty easily because I was tired from hiking and exploring all day and because it was so dark. I love sleeping in the dark. However, at about 3 or 4 a.m., I wake up to a rustling on the outside of my tent. In my half-asleep days, I'm not sure if it was just wind or something else. I kept listening, and I realized that it is something brushing up against our tent, and it sounds like an animal pushing its nose against the tent fabric and sniffing. The sound is coming from the side of the tent right next to my head, so I can clearly hear it super clearly. At this point, my heart is racing, and I am lying frozen in my sleeping bag, hoping that whatever it is outside will leave my tent, and it'll be all over. I think about calling out to my friends in their tent, but I don't want to startle or anger whatever it is outside, so... I decide to just keep lying still and hoping it will leave. My mind is going through every possibility and then I finally realized what it was. When we had set up our tents earlier in the day, there wasn't much flat space so we placed our tents very close to each other evidently. They were too close but when my friend was moving his feet in his sleeping bags, they'd brush up against his tent all which was right near my head. So, all along, it was my friend's feet moving around, and there was no animal or person outside. Thank you, God. However, the weird stuff doesn't stop there, and I only realized that this next part 
was weird once we had left the next day and I had gotten home. As I laid in my tent and tried to slow my heart after realizing the rustling was my friend, I was looking at the shadows of the trees on the walls of my tent. They reminded me of as a kid when a car would slowly turn onto your street and the headlights through the blinds would cast shadows that slowly draw across your ceiling. At the time, it made sense to me, and I thought it was just like when I was a kid, considering I had just thought a creature was outside my tent. This seemed like nothing. However, as I mentioned on earlier, it was a dark and moonless night. So, what could that light have been? It was a very slow, drawing light that had the shadows of the trees moving slowly across the tent walls for about five minutes. We were far from civilization, so there is no way it was a car or a flashlight from a midnight hiker because the light was so steady and slowly moving. Could it have been a flare in the night sky or a comet streaking across the dark starry sky? I still don't know what it could have been, and I only ever realized it after I had gotten home and left the campsite. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true middle-of-nowhere stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Ellis, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Mrs. Innerscare, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klempko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for remaining the pillar on which Back to Ashes is standing. For without you or any other subscriber and supporter of this channel, I would not have a voice. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay safe and take care of yourself out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.